Okay, welcome back. So we were just looking at this value function iteration code. Um, so let, let me revise. Uh, first, we calculate uh, the steady state. It's pretty simple. Then we create the minimum and maximum values around the steady state. Then we set an increment, right? So uh, this will be the distance between our equal spaced capital stock levels. So this vector is that. Okay, so this vector is that. And this is the length of this vector. And now for each, each K, I assign uh, the steady state value function uh, value as the as V fun. Okay. So that's the value function. Uh, wait, I forgot to share my screen. Is that correct? Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so this is my screen. Okay. So uh, parameter values, the states, the minimum and maximum. So these are the bounds, the increment. Then I create the vector and this vector now is a column vector because I, I took the transpose of it and it has a length, uh, big K, okay? So then I assign the value function uh, some values, which is equal to the steady state. Now this is for all K, right? So let me once again, uh, evaluate this part of the code. And if you look at here, for instance, this is V fun, right? For each possible value of K, you have an initial guess. Okay, and these are these possible values of K. Okay. Now, what I want to do is to is to iterate and find the correct value function. Okay. Now, this is my epsilon, and I want what is inside this while loop. So, this while loop, be careful, it will end here. Okay. So, this while loop will continue to work as long as tall is greater than this epsilon. So if it is not converged yet and maximum number of iterations is greater than my current iteration, okay? And this is the empty report for new value function, right? So this is a, this is a vector of length K. Now, I start with consumption, okay? And this is your budget constraint, if you look at this carefully, right? So this is calculating consumption levels for each state. So this is your KT, right? You're at, you at state KT for each, in, for each and every state, uh, and for, for each state, for any possible value of KT plus one, you calculate the consumption level. But then consumption cannot be negative, right? So we want to uh, we want to find if consumption is negative for some of these K values, we want to uh, we want to uh, equate it to a very small number. So so this this EPS is a very small, very, very small number, okay? Then these are my consumption levels that, that are not negative, right? Then I write my Bellman equation. This is my Bellman equation, right? This is my initial guess. And this is the Bellman equation, which is not maximized yet, okay? Here, I maximize the value function, okay? How do I do that? Now, at this step, I calculate all possible values, right? Look at this. This is all possible consumption levels that are positive. This is my beta. This is my initial guess. So at this step, I find the index i, okay? I, I, I basically write for i 
the maximum of the value function. Then for that index, for that index, I find uh, what is it that really maximizes my capital stock. So that's PF I becomes my capital stock. Okay, policy function is here uh, written in, in terms of capital stock, okay? Now this will be done, look at this for loop. This will be done for all the elements in my grid, okay? For all the elements, I will find uh, for the initial guess, of course, right? I will find uh, the policy function, okay? Which maximizes my, you know, the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. Then I check the distance, okay? Now be careful, this is, this is a vector, right? Because V nu is a vector, V fun is a vector. This is initial guess, this is new guess, right? So the norm of this distance will be tall, this one. And then iteration will be increasing one, right? Because now I'm, I've, I've, I'm, I'm done with this iteration, then I equate V1 to V new, okay, here. Because that's the maximum of V all, right? Then it stops here, right? So it goes back again. After, after the first step, it checks, this condition checks whether tolerance is greater than 10 to the minus six and whether max iter is greater than iter, okay? Then it starts from here again, okay? And this continues until when, until either I hit the maximum number of iterations or the tolerance is less than 10 to the minus six here. The distance between, the norm of the distance between V new and V form. Then I look at the time, how much time has passed. Then I uh, reshape the policy function, et cetera. Then I'm gonna uh, draw, draw them, okay? So let's run this. And it is already, oh, okay, it's working. And it is done now. Okay. So let's, let's first look at the iteration. So it started one and 0.66. So what are these? These are that. In the code, I want to look at iteration and my tolerance, current tolerance, okay? So in the initial iteration, in the initial iteration, the, to the tolerance level is 0.66. Next iteration, 0.29. Next iteration, 0.11. Next iteration, 0 0.04. And that goes on. In each iteration, the distance between Vj and Vj plus one decreases, okay? In each iteration, it decreases, it keeps decreasing. Remember it is 10 to the minus six. That's my, that's my epsilon. And eventually at step 195, it stops in total, it spans 11 seconds. Okay, 11 seconds with this increment with around 1000 grid points 
And this is the final level of the terms. As you see, 9.6 times 10 to the minus seven. Okay. Now, this one is the policy function and this one is the value function. Okay, of course, these are approximations, right? How do I know that? Well, look at the code first. In the code for the policy function, I plot V fun, right? So where is V fun here? V fun is, is here. You see, so for each K, there is now a value associated with that K, okay? Now let's check whether the steady state is true. So in the steady state, uh, the steady state value function level was equal to 1.67. So it is uh, here, this is the, so this one is very similar to, to the steady state value of the value, value function, right? The steady state level of the value function. So at that dimension, K must be close to the, uh, K must be close to the steady state, right? So where's, where's K? Uh, Okay, he is. You see, it's very close to the steady state value. So the, so the steady state is between these two observations, these two grid points, okay? And that's your strictly increasing, strictly concave, value and policy functions, okay? So what I show you analytically works exactly in the same way. The only thing I should be careful with is the negative consumption levels in this simple problem, of course. Um, so that's it. So I can, I can send you the code, but it's better, of course, if you try to write your own. Uh, I will not be asking you anything about the numerical applications of this stuff, but uh, I may ask, of course, some, some problems uh, that you use policy function iteration or value function iteration, obviously. Okay, so any questions about all this? <laughs> So for the, for the remaining, I don't know, half an hour, uh, I want to give you a couple of examples and I want to discuss uh, the unbounded, unbounded cases, okay? Uh, because that, that assumption that we, we need to maintain for some of the uh, results is not, is not satisfied uh, in, in most economic models. In most economic models, the reward function is not bounded itself, but still uh, we, get, uh, we get correct results and I'm gonna explain how. So uh, let me share my whiteboard. Okay. So let's, Let's try to understand this bound, bounded function argument, okay? So the general problem will be like this, right? So it will be like, uh, so we want to maximize, uh, so, uh, okay. So there will be a state vector, okay? And there will be a control vector so this reward function will be a function of the state and the control. There will be a discounting term and the state vector will be evolving in this way. So obviously, uh, uh, so there is this, let's say, 
a function. So this function is vector valued, obviously, right? So this also depends on controls and states. So uh, if we need to be more specific, uh, we have n state variables and uh, ct is an element of this uh, of this set. Okay. So uh, the general conditions for optimality uh, are for each state, right? For each state variable, uh, let's say for each i, we have a uh, derivative of RCT ST with respect to uh, C I T, okay, uh, plus beta, um, the derivative of um, V S T plus one uh, with respect to um, uh, C I T. Okay, but this one, of course, since there are many states, right? So you have to be uh, you have to be doing that for for each and every state. Okay, so this will be times the derivative of s j t plus one c i t, and then for the other state variables, which will equal to zero. And then for each state variable, uh, you will have uh, the derivative of the value function with respect to state variable J will be uh, the derivative of R with respect to J plus beta. Again, you will have all the derivatives with respect to SJT. Okay, then also for each J again, uh, you will have transversality conditions. Okay. Now, usually uh, to, to use the projection methods and to prove that there is an equilibrium, I mean, there's a, there's a solution path, uh, we require R to be a bounded function. Okay, let me write in a different color. So we require R C T S T to be bounded. Okay. And typically those functions that we work with in economics are not bounded, right? So uh, typically if this is a utility function, for instance, uh, uh, it is, let's say the natural logarithm or it is a power function, right? Uh, it could be a linear utility function. Uh, so they're not, they're not bounded, all right? Then how come uh, we can ensure that there is a solution, okay? Well, there are two cases. Most of the time in economic problems, there is a constraint, okay? And that constraint, that constraint allow us to work with compact choice sets, okay? There is this feasibility condition, all right? So what does this mean? This means C usually do not go to positive infinity, okay? Because you do not have infinite resources, all right? So if your model is not a model of growth, if if K will be remaining less than positive infinity, then F of K will be less than positive infinity. Then this set, this choice set for consumption will be uh, bounded. And it is already closed, right? Because uh, this is with equality. So then, this set will be compact, then we are good. Okay. 
Now, of course, the problem appears, the problem is persistent if there is graft, all right? And let me show you what happens in this case. So let's look at a very simple wealth accumulation problem. Okay, this is the simplest wealth accumulation problem you're gonna see, all right? So the budget constraint is, so you have this asset income and you have your consumption, all right? So initially, initially, of course, your asset stock is given, uh, 80 plus one must be between R80 and zero and CT must be between R80 and zero, okay? So, so what's going on here? So I need my first of the conditions, right? So for C, I have one over CT plus beta uh, derivative of VA. Then I have by the chain rule. Uh, so I realize that CT will always be greater than zero because otherwise it is not optimal. Uh, so this one will be written in more a more compact way in this way, right? So uh, it will be equal to that. Okay, because this one is minus one. Okay. So uh, the envelope condition will be V A A T plus so equals uh, what beta. V A AT plus one. Remember that the effect of effect on C drops out because of this constraint. Okay. Because of this, the general effect on so so this this term will disappear. Okay. This term will disappear from this equation here. So I have that plus so times. I have the derivative of 80 plus one with respect to 80, right? And this is equal to what? So this can be written as beta R V A 80 plus one. Okay. Then I have the transversality constraint. I can I can check later. Okay. So um, so you have essentially a dynamical system, right? So you have you have your uh, constraint, then you have uh, beta lambda t plus one. So here I define lambda as this variable, okay? Then you have lambda t beta r lambda t plus one, right? So what's happening here? Now, obviously, obviously, uh, you can you can write the time path time path of lambda, right? Because lambda t plus one is equal to what? Uh, beta r minus lambda t, right? So if you iterate, so lambda one is beta r lambda zero, then lambda two beta r lambda one. So then you have uh, beta r minus two lambda zero, right? So do you find the time path of lambda? Okay. Then of course, if you put this uh, back into the first order condition with consumption, so you realize that consumption is equal to uh, beta to the minus one lambda t plus one to the minus one, right? So you have beta to the minus one. So what is your lambda t plus one? Your lambda t plus one is uh, beta r minus t minus one, right? Uh, lambda zero to the minus one. So you have something like this. You have some constants here, okay? times, uh, so you have, let's, let's do this. 
So you have some constants here times beta r uh, t. You can put some of the constants of beta and r to here as well. Okay. So then you have the time path of consumption. All right. Now, if, if beta r is greater than one, right? If beta r is greater than, actually it is, if it is greater than or equal to one, okay? Consumption, so if, if so forget about stability for a moment. So if it is strictly greater than one, consumption will go to positive infinity now, right? Because if you look at here, so there's there's possibility of growth in the belt stock, right? So write your constraint. So write the growth rate of belt stock in this way, right? This is basically the AK model now, right? Uh, and this will tell you as long as uh, beta R is greater than one, there could be possibility of consumption growth. Now, of course, we have to check whether this is feasible and whether this is satisfying the, uh, the transversality condition, but also we have to check whether this is bounded. Remember, our utility function is this. from t equals zero, post infinity. So what do I have here? I have beta t, natural logarithm of some constants. So let's, let's denote these constants by phi. Then I have beta r t, right? So what's going on? Well, uh, I have what? I have constants going out. Right? Constants going out. I have beta t. Um, then I have, since this is logarithmic, I have t times ln beta r. Okay? Now that also goes out. So then again, I have constants t equals zero to post infinity beta t t, okay? Now the question is, of course, this must be less than positive infinity, all right? And as you see, it is, right? How do I know that? How do I know that this does not go to, uh, so, so this will be a number less than positive infinity, since this is already constant, it will be also less than positive infinity, then you, will be less than positive infinity, u star i. How do I know that? Well, because, uh, so there are two parts here, right? One part is decreasing. The other part is increasing. The thing is that this part is decreasing faster, okay? That part is decreasing faster. So beta t times t uh, goes to zero. So the sum of them goes to a constant, right? But then we still have to check how do we grow, right? So I understand that the growth rate of ct is beta r if it is greater than one. But I also have this, right? I also have this. So uh, in a balanced growth model, if we, if we want growth, uh, we need to be careful about this, right? This term. So we want CTAT to go to some constant, okay? Now, if that's the case, the growth rates must be the same, right? So CT plus one divided by CT must be equal to 
80 plus one divided by 80. So what do I have from this? I have beta R must be equal to R minus C. So C star must be equal to uh, R one minus beta, okay? So that's exactly the solution. Remember in the continuous time model, in the continuous time model, you have uh, e to the minus rho t ln ct, right? From zero to post infinity. And you had a dot t equals r a t minus ct. Of course, here r is percentage interest rate, here r is gross. Uh, so if you if you be if you if you write like this, then you understand that the solutions are so, so the solution to this problem uh, on a balanced growth path is exactly like this. Okay. So initial at the initial period, of course, the consumer jumps to the steady state. Now, what about the uh, what about the transversality condition? Well, here your transversality condition is what you so you have uh, you have a limit t goes to post infinity. You have beta t. Uh, one over uh, CT times AT equals zero, right? Something like that. So here, of course, this, this goes to a constant, right? So, so uh, you have one over psi star uh, limit beta T equals zero. So this is equal to zero, okay? Um, so that's it. That's, that's how typically we, we use to check. Now, let me give you an exercise. So the same model, but with a different utility function and you're gonna, you're gonna get a different result, of course. Uh, again, there's the asset, there's the utility function. Now suppose that the utility function is this. Okay, the power function. Uh, and the constraint is set. Uh, in some models, by the way, so I want you to do exactly the same stuff. So here, sigma is greater than zero, let's say. Uh, it could be any real number, but let's say it's greater than zero. Uh, so there's also this formulation. So in some texts, you consume your S, you consume from your assets, and then you save the rest, okay? So these two formulations, as you know, are, are, are a bit different, okay? Uh, let me give you another example. Um, it's not just about uh, growth. So, so in, this, in this one, in this exercise, I want you to find the condition that implies uh, condition that implies this one is less than post infinity, okay? I want you to find this condition. And R is greater than zero, beta is between zero and one, okay? Um, another example would be the familiar example we used earlier, so a firm, firm problem. So suppose that there is this firm, okay? So this firm uh, discounts the future profits in this particular way. So this becomes the value of the firm, okay? So profit uh, depends on, uh, let's say there's a production function, okay? Uh, there is, uh, of course, there is uh, capital, there's labor, then the firm pays the cost for labor in a, in, the, in a particular period, 
and then firms, the firm makes an investment, investment expenditure. The investment expenditure uh, affects, of course, the accumulation of capital, right? So here R is greater than zero. This is wage greater than zero. Delta is the depreciation rate that is between zero and one. Um, and K zero uh, is given. So how do you proceed with this problem? So think about this and let's assume uh, as in Takayama, let's assume that these are, these are given, uh, okay? So, so let's assume this is I bar, this is I bar, okay? So try to understand which one is control, which one is state, right? So it's, it's pretty obvious. We already studied this problem in continuous time. So work on this and compare, compare the results with the continuous time. I can explain the solution uh, next week. There are other examples I have. Uh, there's one leisure example. There's one uh, job search example. Uh, all of these, uh, we will still have time. There's a human capital example. So possibly next week, we're gonna cover all of these. Uh, okay, so um, any questions in our limited time, but we can, we can reconnect again if you like. So I have time. If you have nothing to ask, then we're gonna go, but if you have questions, we can reconnect again. Okay then, uh, next week I will show you some stochastic problems as well. Uh, we're not gonna deal with solving them because almost always we, we, we use computers to do that. Uh, I, can, I can show you an example of value function iteration with a, uh, with a stochastic model. Uh, then we're gonna conclude next week, all right? So uh, I wish you happy to uh, a good week. Uh, a productive and healthy week. So see you, see you next Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Right. See you. All right. Bye bye. Sure, sure.